recording right now. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Marty Atkinson, and I am your moderator for today. And I'm also the conference coordinator, the one with the day's look in her eyes. Uh, very happy to uh, have everybody here. It looks like we've got a good crowd to get started with. And I'm very delighted to have Jane Park uh, be our presenter today. She's from Creative Commons. She's coming to us from Brooklyn, New York, where she helps creators, companies, and institutions leverage Creative Commons licensing and Creative Commons license content. She's originally a California native and has degrees in philosophy and creative writing from UC Berkeley. She's involved with the Peer-to-Peer -Peer University and has designed and facilitated a course on creative nonfiction writing. Before Creative Commons, she worked with AmeriCorps and the National Writing Project. She has an interest in pretty much everything with a penchant for simplifying and spontaneous activity. It's all yours, Jane. Okay, great. Marty, you can hear me fine, right? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you guys all for being here. I'm very happy to be able to be part of the kickoff, the online teaching conference. Um, so basically, as Marty introduced me, my name is Jane Park, and I'm at Creative Commons. If you have any questions after this presentation that you forget to ask me or don't have the chance to, feel free to email me at that email address, janepark at creativecommons.org. Um, so most of you, I'm not sure what the level of familiarity with Creative Commons is in this Illuminate room, but today what I'm going to be going over is the basics of Creative Commons, uh, what we are, what we do, go over the Creative Commons licenses briefly, how you can find Creative Commons licensed content, um, and then talk about Creative Commons specifically in the open education space and the various uh, high profile and more innovative, newer projects that are using Creative Commons licenses. And then at the end, you can feel free to ask me any questions or you know, do any demos or walk you through anything on the website. Um, but I thought I'd, I would begin by kind of showing you some major sites that you may have already be familiar with, such as Flickr, the major uh, photo sharing website. This is, this is probably the most popular way most people stumble upon Creative Commons licenses because they have enabled CC license choices for their photographers, so anyone who has a Flickr account can upload photos under the various CC licenses. Um, there's also Wikipedia that you may be familiar with that has a Creative Commons license on all 17 million articles in 270 languages. They are all under the same Creative Commons license, which is a Creative Commons attribution share alike license. And you may also, but more rarely, have stumbled across Creative Commons on whitehouse.gov. Not a lot of people know, but if you click on the copyright link on whitehouse.gov, it takes you to a page that explains that all uh, information on the site that is not created by the government itself, so third-party content, is licensed under the most open Creative Commons attribution license for you to reuse. So those are three kind of major sites that have employed Creative Commons licensing. And before I uh, go into my presentation, I thought um, I would show a video uh, called The Shared Culture. I'm going to copy and paste the link in so Marty can enable it to open in all of your browser windows. Some of you may have seen this. It's basically a video that Jesse Dillon, Bob Dillon's son, created for us one year uh, for one of our annual campaigns. And it gives a nice kind of overview of the Creative Commons landscape, and it shows our board members talking about Creative Commons. And it should be so opening on a browser. Um, on your own con on your own computer. Yeah, and once it opens, you're going to have to click play because it won't automatically start playing. It's still loading on my browser, so it might take a while for everyone as well. If it takes too long, we can just skip it. Cause it's just a nice um, video, but it's not crucial to this presentation. And also, if you're not getting it to play, you might want to right-click on the Creative Commons video and hit play.
So it loaded for me. Um, I'm getting some audio feedback. Okay, we're good. Um, Becky said it's still loading for her. What do you think, Friday? Um, we're gonna. Ha I I would say let's move on pretty soon. People can watch it at their own pace, and um, you can pause it or watch it at, as we go on. Okay. Um, so why don't I just... Uh... Should I just move on then? Can people multitask or pause their videos? Because some people can't seem to be running it. Yeah, people are saying they can watch it later. Okay, great. Um, so that video gives you a nice, you know, kind of glamorous picture of our board members, who are great. They're all experts in their field. Um, and if you ever run into one of them, um, feel free to strike up a conversation. So moving on, um, so you've probably run into Creative Commons in these different avenues, but what exactly is Creative Commons? Uh, basically, Creative Commons is an actual organization. We're a small nonprofit, and we're headquartered in Mountain View, California. Uh, we were previously in San Francisco, but we moved offices earlier this year. And we're an international organization, but this is just a headquarters. We have about 30 employees around the world, and we work in a distributed fashion. Our mission is to develop, support, and steward legal and technical infrastructure that maximizes digital creativity, sharing, and innovation. Basically, we make sharing easy, legal, and scalable. And our vision is to realize the full potential of the internet. So that means universal access to research and education, full participation in culture, and a new era of development, growth, and productivity. And this may all sound somewhat complicated and ambitious, but the way we go about doing it is actually really simple. We offer free legal and technical tools that allow artists, musicians, educators, journalists, and others to publish their works on more flexible terms than the default all rights reserved copyright. And these are known as the Creative Commons licenses and our public domain tools. One way to explain Creative Commons and why it's useful is by describing its place within the internet stack. So some of you may have seen this stack already if you've seen presentations by our former CEO, Joey Ito. But I'm going to go ahead and go through it again because it's actually pretty simple. The history of the Internet has been a history of openness. So the lower layers of the Internet stack are characterized by open standards. These layers are constituted by the physical layer, so all the computers in your homes. And next is the network layer, what, what connects the, computer, the computers in your homes to each other. And then next is the web layer, the web pages we can all access at the same time. And these pieces of the stack are not controlled by intellectual property or a particular company. Anyone can participate in these parts of the system without asking permission. But the content layer at the top is very different. It has a lot of legal friction because of default copyright laws. Uh, for instance, a lot of money, time, and other resources go into negotiating rights to content. And at this top layer, we don't have interoperability in the same way we have interoperability within the other layers, which is what makes the Internet free and accessible to everybody. And this is because of default copyright law. What used to be an obscure area of law, only relevant to book publishers, music, and movie studios 50 years ago, has become increasingly relevant to our daily lives. So pretty much whether you know it or not, on any given day, you and your students arguably commit multiple acts of copyright infringement while you are doing your you know, everyday activities. So for instance, when you're reading the news, blogs, looking up the weather, watching a video of someone's cat, you're automatically stepping into copyright territory because your web browser automatically makes copies of these works. 
you also step into copyright territory when you print out the day's news for distribution in your classroom, when you respond to an email because email automatically copies the full text of the original email in the response, when you send your friend a photograph of a funny billboard or sign, when you email a copy of any photograph you didn't take yourself, and when you upload a video of a friend singing a print song and post it to YouTube. These are everyday activities that everyone engages in. Um, the only reason it seems okay is that copyright holders choose not to go after these sorts of issues or are simply ignorant of the fact. So the current law relies on the generosity or ignorance of copyright holders to function as we expect it to. So what is copyright? What does it protect and what is its purpose? Copyright protection has been around a very long time. The United States Constitution states that Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So the purpose of copyright law, at least in the United States, is to provide an incentive to creators to create. And copyright law covers all forms of creativity, um, including literature, music, architecture, and choreography. Basically, any creativity that you can fit into a tangible medium is covered by copyright law. Copyright law governs what you can do with copies of these creative works. So whenever you want to make a copy of a creative work, distribute a copy, perform or display a copy publicly, or adapt a copy in some way, such as translate it, edit it, or remix it, you have to obtain the explicit permission of the author. And today, um, copyright in the United States is all rights reserved and automatic, which means it's granted at the instant of creation without any need for registration. So that means at the instant you finish typing your email or writing that blog post, there is no need to register it at some office. You automatically have the exclusive copyright to it in the United States. And copyright in the United States lasts the life of the author plus 70 years, and it lasts 95 years for corporate works. So the basic gist of it is that it lasts a very long time and it keeps getting extended because it didn't always used to be this way. Copyright started out as a limited right as we read in the Constitution. Creators had to apply for and renew um, their copyright every 14 years. But starting in 1976, copyright became automatic and much more restrictive. Every time works are about to fall into the public domain, new laws are passed. And if you get it wrong, it can cost you. Each infringement can cost you a minimum of $750 all the way up to $150,000. Now, those numbers may be different today in this economy, maybe, um, but this is just for one work. So copyright started out protecting works for only 14 years and then only published books, but by 1976, all kinds of creativity were being protected for much longer periods of time. Then along came personal computers and the internet, and now pretty much everything we do is regulated by copyright. And today, everyone is a copyright owner, whether they realize it or not. But with Creative Commons, you have a choice um, to change the default rules. You can choose how you want to share your creative and educational works with others. So going back to the internet stack, we've seen that there's friction at this top content layer because of increasingly restrictive copyright laws, and that there can be a great deal of cost in negotiating these rights. And what Creative Commons basically does is to help lower these transaction costs of sharing content on the web by granting permission in advance. And it does this through a simple copyright license. The Creative Commons license is an easy, standardized way to grant permissions to your work while reserving the rights to others. Using a Creative Commons license communicates to others how they can use your creativity. And there are two simple steps to applying a Creative Commons license to your work. The first step is to choose the conditions that you want to attach to the work. All Creative Commons licenses require attribution, also known as credit in the academic world, to the original author of the work. And after that, you can decide which additional conditions you want to apply. For instance, whether you want to prohibit commercial uses of the creative work, and then you would choose a non-commercial condition, whether you want to require that downstream users also reshare their adaptation of your work under the same license, and that then you would apply the share alike condition, or whether you only want your work distributed as is. Um, so you don't want people to alter it, modify it, or translate it without your express permission.
and then you would choose a no derivative works condition. And so once you choose your, the conditions that you want, um, the second step is to receive the license that reflects your intentions. There are six Creative Commons licenses that reflect a spectrum of rights a creator wants to communicate. And this is important because we realize that one size does not fit all, so um, we have these six licenses that span from the most open, which is a Creative Commons Attribution License to the most closed. At the lower right, the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivative Works option. And basically, once you receive this license, you place the icon and the link to the license that you chose on your website or your content, and it signals to others how you want your work to be used and shared. And all they have to do is click on the license, and it takes them to the license um, page where they can read what they can and can't do with your work. So for example, if on Flickr I decide to release all of my photos under a Creative Commons attribution license, it means that anyone can take my photos and distribute, remix, tweak, and build upon them, even commercially, as long as they give me credit. So this is a lot of information. Um, basically, you can revisit this link later if you're considering Creative Commons licensing, or you can just walk through the steps because there's no registration process. You can just uh, test it out. And if you go to this link, creativecommons.org slash choose, it'll take you to this page where you um, read a little blurb and some disclaimers, and it, it'll give you links to some more information about things you might want to know before licensing your work, which you should probably read if this is the first time you're CC licensing your work. And you just uh, answer the questions there. Do you want to allow commercial uses of your work? Do you want to allow modifications, et cetera? They're drop-down questions, really simple. Type in additional information if you want to, which is you know information about the author, um, the web page maybe that the work is hosted, et cetera. And then you click OK, and it will take you to this page, and it gives you the license that you've chosen. And you can see it gives you the icon and the, inf and the text next to it. But the great thing about Creative Commons this License Chooser is that if you have a blog or a web page, all you have to do is copy and paste the HTML code right there into your uh, website, into the skin of your website, or into your blog, and it automatically displays the icon and that text for you. So that's something you can play around with. You can go through this process a million times. It won't affect anything until you put the license actually on your website. It doesn't mean your work is licensed because this is not a registry. Um, so feel free to play with that after the presentation. But for now, I'm going to go on and Um, so yeah, I'll talk. I'll answer questions about YouTube later because that was a recent development that was just announced this morning in a press release and it leaked last night. But I'll remind me about the YouTube um, question later. Uh, for now, I'm going to talk about um, a few things that everyone should probably know about Creative Commons licenses. Um, so Creative Commons licenses are built on copyright law. And it does not replace, substitute, or provide an alternative to copyright. This is a pretty important point because a lot of people new to CC don't realize they think Creative Commons might be against copyright law, especially you know the big recording companies. They say Creative Commons is anti-copyright, but that's actually pretty nonsensical because Creative Commons licenses are built on the law. They couldn't work if copyright law didn't exist. All it does is give you a way to manage your copyright um, and kind of. Um, make sure that you know which conditions you're giving away and which you're not. Another important point is that Creative Commons licenses do not preclude fair use, but pick up where fair use leaves off. This is really important for educators because I know a lot of you rely on fair use uh, for you know, doing work in your classrooms. And you can still make a fair use of a Creative Commons licensed work. For example, if the creator has not given permission for commercial use, but you make a fair commercial use, then the license doesn't stop you from doing that. You can also always ask the creator for permission to go beyond the scope of the license. Creative Commons um, does not affect rights that are not covered by copyright. So this is also important because uh, you get more than copyright in a work when you create something, depending on which country you live in. You may get a whole host of rights, such as publicity rights, moral rights, or privacy rights. And because Creative Commons licenses only deal with copyright law, all these other rights that you get when you create a work are not affected by the CC license. Creative Commons licenses are also irrevoc irrevocable and perpetual. So that means if you license something today under a Creative Commons license, but tomorrow you decide to remove the license, anyone who accessed your work today 
can um, use it under the Creative Commons license pretty much forever. Um, but Creative Commons licenses can also be changed and removed from a work. So that means if you access the work tomorrow and the person has removed that um, Creative Commons license, you do not, uh, you cannot um, use it under the same CC license because the creator has changed the license. Um, and the last important point is that Creative Commons licenses are not exclusive, so it allows for dual licensing. This is important for people like musicians who want to strike up uh, recording contracts, but they have already CC licensed their music, and they are free to do so because uh, the licenses are not exclusive and it allows for dual licensing. Oh, Brad has a question for you on the chat. Um, no, we do not have a searchable database of CC licensed works. Um, we are working on improving search and discovery of CC licensed works um, and CC licensed educational works, and I will actually get to that in another slide, um, in, a pretty, in, a, in a few slides actually. Um, so Creative Commons licenses are really unique because they are expressed in three ways. Um, they are different from any other copyright license you'll find on the web. Um, they are especially designed for the digital age. At, the, at base, each license is a traditional legal tool with the kind of language and text formats that lawyers know and love. We call this the legal code layer of each license, and this has been vetted by a global team of legal experts, and this is what makes CC licenses enforceable in a court of law. But since most creators, educators, artists, and scientists are not lawyers, we also make the licenses available in a format that no, normal people can read and understand. And this is called the common seed, or the human readable version of the license, and it summarizes the most important terms and conditions of the license into a few universal icons and non-technical language. And we can think of the common seed as the user-friendly interface to the legal code beneath. So it's basically for people like you and me, who just want to know very quickly what we can and can't do with the work. Uh, Jane, Fla Flavio wants to know if Creative Commons licensing works internationally. I actually was going to get to that point, but Creative Commons licenses are international, um, and they have been ported to about 52 jurisdictions around the world. But there's an unported version that works with that is um, completely in line with international copyright laws. So I'll get to that in another slide too. Um, and the final. So I'm going to ask, answer Kathy's question really quickly. So for software, uh, the, you know, the free software, open source software movement started before Creative Commons. Creative Commons came out of that in a way. And so for software, there's a whole host of other licenses. You do not use Creative Commons licenses for software. It's only appropriate for content um, that is not software that can be put into a tangible medium. Uh, the final layer of the license design is the machine-readable metadata. So this is what you saw in the license chooser, and this is what really makes Creative Commons licenses viable for this Internet age. This is a small snippet of HTML code, and it summarizes the Creative Commons license and the associated metadata, such as who the work is authored by, into a format that software, search engines, and other kinds of technology can understand. Uh, when you choose a license on our website, you receive the snippet, and you copy and paste it into your web page. And when you properly mark your work in this way, your work um, is discoverable by Creative Commons enabled search engines on the web, such as Google and Yahoo. And uh, web platforms that have integrated Creative Commons license options, such as Flickr, can automatically take care of the machine readable step for you because you can choose a license on their website. So basically, um, if you go to search.creativecommons.org, this is a search portal to the different sites that have marked, um, that have installed Creative Commons license filters or that have enabled CC licensing for their users. So you can see Google, Yahoo, Flickr, Blip TV, Gemendo, and Cement Express. This is not a search engine, it's a search portal. So it's pretty much like performing a Google search. Uh, Google is not responsible for what you find on web pages. And so just like anything you find on the web, you have to make sure that what you find is you know, actually under that CC license or actually authored by that person because there's just no way to verify um, because we do not uh, do a registry of CC license work and this is not a database. It's just a search tool. But we are working on other search um, capabilities which I'll go through um, later. But this is pretty useful that a lot of people use. You can also go directly to those sites like Google and Yahoo and 
if you click on their advanced search, it gives you the option to search for CC license content. Um, and so that's the URL right there that she already copied and pasted. So Blaine asked, are there any checks in place to hold users accountable for mislicensing? Um, there's not official checks, but what people do do, they're a huge CC community, so what usually happens is that someone will, you know, email, someone will blog about it or Twitter about it, and then that person will eventually take it down. Um, that's usually how it happens. The community kind of rallies around it, and it's pretty quick how it happens. But just like anything that's copyrighted on the web, even if there were no CC licenses in existence, people could always say, I authored this, you know, so. That's just the risk that you take with the internet. Um, so that's the website. <laughs> so that's the <laughs> yes, that's true. It works. If a whole group of people online are shaming you, it, it usually works. Um, and then if it doesn't work, people you know can sue. But there are not a lot of court cases around Creative Commons licenses because usually people take it down if it's erroneous. Um, so now getting on to someone's question previously about whether Creative Commons licenses are international, yes. Um, we are not us -centered. We are a global organization and our licenses are also global. Um, in addition to being based on international copyright laws, Creative Commons licenses have been ported to 52 jurisdictions around the world and we have 20 more jurisdictions in the works. And this means that they have been translated and adapted to the language and laws of these countries. Porting is not necessary for the license to be viable, but it does make it easier for a license to be interpreted in a court of law in that country. So I think someone asked about China. So if you, there, China, there is a Chinese translation of the license, and we do have like four Chinese jurisdictions because I think there's a Hong Kong jurisdiction, a Taiwanese jurisdiction, a mainland China jurisdiction, etc. Um, and if you go to our website, there will be a link to the CC Affiliate Network, which contains um, it's a database of all the 52 jurisdictions we have around the world and the jurisdiction leads that are present in those countries that are leading Creative Commons efforts there. Um, so since Creative Commons licenses um, and the organization was founded back in 2001, the number of Creative Commons licensed works on the web have grown each year, almost exponentially. So today, we estimate through Google and Yahoo search engine count that there are over 500 million works on the web. And these are estimates just based on those people who have properly marked up their work. So they've, you know, come to our license chooser or they've used Flickr to, you know, choose a license. So there are probably a lot of works out there where people just say this is under a CC license, but, you know, don't provide the machine readable metadata. Much of these works are educational in nature. So this is a landing page for those who are interested in education and how Creative Commons fits in. It provides a very basic overview and then provides links to more information. And I encourage you to check this out after. Um, MIT OpenCourseWare is probably one that you have all heard of. It's the most famous educational use case of CC licenses. MIT is the largest open courseware project with 2,000 courses online under a Creative Commons license, specifically the non-commercial share alike license. And what MIT OpenCourseWare does is that it doesn't attempt to reverse an MIT education, but instead shares their course resources with the world. So the project has become very useful for prospective students, current students, teachers in developing curriculum, alumni who want to stay connected to what's going on at MIT, and administration, of course, in marketing the university. And MIT OpenCourseWare is part of a worldwide movement known as Open Educational Resources. And OER may be the single most compelling use of Creative Commons tools. It's a concept that any member of the public can understand pretty quickly because education, you know, is a public good. Most people agree with that. They agree that it should be open and free to some extent. There are several definitions of OER, including by UNESCO and the Hewlett Foundation. Hewlett defines OER as teaching, learning, and research resources that reside in the public domain or have been released under a license that permits their free use or repurposing by others. You might wonder how open educational resources are different from all the other innovative digital materials being used by teachers today. So I thought I might go over the difference. The difference is that while most digital resources 
are resources you can see online, usually for free. There are limits to how you can use those resources due to copyright laws. And just as we can negotiate a license to use other works, such as music and film, we can negotiate a license to use educational resources, or as many teachers and librarians do, use educational resources without permission as specified under fair use and other exceptions to copyright law. Open educational resources, on the other hand, are resources you can use without additional negotiation because the permissions have already been granted in advance via open licenses, such as Creative Commons licenses. And these permissions include the rights to customize and share the materials. Um, and in the open education space, CC licenses are used for the majority of open educational resources, enabling OER's benefits and overcoming barriers. For instance, Creative Commons licenses provide the legal permissions necessary to address language barriers. So here's a course on globalization offered by MIT OpenCourseWare. Many MIT courses like this one are being translated into other languages, and this translation is enabled by the Creative Commons license, which pre-clears the rights to translate the material, allowing anyone or institution in the world to translate without the need of a middleman, also known as university lawyers wading through university red tape. So this is a Portuguese translation of the same MIT OpenCourseWare class for university apps. The Creative Commons license also allows OER, like textbooks, to be continuously updated and improved. Um, some of you may be familiar with Collaborative Statistics. It's an introductory textbook to statistics um, at the college level that was licensed openly by its authors. And this textbook um, now lives on Connections, a platform for our open educational resources. And it's being updated to this day and has been adapted for use in community colleges around the country. And collaborative statistics, along with um, a lot of other open education resources on their site, is default licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license. Um, so, Kathy, why don't you go to cnx.org, and then that's a repository that hosts connections or hosts collaborative statistics. You can search there for collaborative statistics. Um, so, Connections is one repository where you can collaborate with other teachers to develop resources like textbooks or full courses. Pretty much Connections breaks down content into modular forms so that you can work in a distributed fashion on like one comprehensive course and you can work on different parts of it. Um, and there are a lot of other sites like this that um, are use CC licenses and uh, enable collaboration. And if you, again, if you go to the Education Lightning page, there will be links to more projects. So Creative Commons licensing is also helping teachers and students find good educational content by addressing the challenges to information discovery. So it's overcoming discovery barriers. So this has to do with the search and discovery I mentioned earlier. In the past, the main issue with finding content was in distribution of content. Uh, media used to be a delivery problem back when it was physical, and there was also the issue of scarcity. But today, with digital content and the web, obviously we have no problem with scarcity or distribution. But because there is so much content out there, we do have issues with finding the right stuff or stuff relevant to our needs. In education, we especially want to find stuff that we know we can use, customize, and share again. So what Creative Commons is doing is it's helping to improve discovery by developing tools such as Discover Ad. Discover Ed is a search prototype that is aiming to provide scalable search and discovery for educational resources on the web. It pulls in information from trusted curators through content feeds. Um, this project is actually tabled for now, but you can still check it out at discovered.creativecommons.org. So let me actually type that in. Um, there's a lot of other works in the search and discovery space right now. Um, but I can't divulge those yet um, because they aren't developed. Um, but in addition to our search prototype, we also work with search engines like Google and Yahoo to integrate those CC license filters that you may have discovered in the advanced search section. So if you want to keep up to date on the search and discovery news, I encourage you to, to subscribe to our web blog because that will contain the most up-to-date information. We also have a monthly newsletter that you can access through our website and subscribe to.
Um, but just know that we are working um, in the search and discovery space to improve search, especially for education. Um, Creative Commons also addresses technical barriers. So another challenge we face is accessibility, such as accessibility to persons with disabilities and accessibility via other formats and devices to accommodate those with poor internet connections, smaller screens, or mobile devices. So for instance, Bookshare is the world's largest accessible online library for people with print disabilities. And it was awarded a grant by the U.S. Department of Education aimed at creating the first accessible versions of open content digital textbooks. Open textbooks under CC licenses that allow adaptation can be converted into accessible formats such as audio and braille around the world. So no extra transaction costs have to be incurred for these adaptations to take place. Any entity with the resources to adapt these textbooks may do so since the rights are pre-cleared via Creative Commons. I think I skipped ahead. Um, so I don't think there are any questions at this point. Creative Commons licenses are also helping the adoption and use of OER by addressing cultural barriers. So for instance, in the open courseware world, the ability to adapt the work to local context via translations and by incorporating cultural references has become central to the spirit of the movement. And one example of that um, is a CIVIL project in South Africa, uh, which works to make a core set of teaching materials available under an open license that allows communities to adapt and collaboratively develop OER that realize local needs. So they feel that open licenses enhance innovation, enlighten the load on individual teachers, and result in localized context-specific materials that are immediately useful to teachers. So you can check that out at CIVILA.org, so just how it's spelled there.org if you're interested in that project, or if you live in South Africa and want to get involved. Um, but lastly, Creative Commons is not just limited to the nonprofit education world. CC licenses are being used and incorporated into emerging business models as well, and also into kind of fledgling innovative projects, which I'll mention. So some of you may have heard of Flat World Knowledge. It's a commercial textbook publisher that incorporates CC licenses into the core of their business model. Jane, could I interrupt uh -huh. here a second? Flat World Knowledge is going to be our next kickoff session on Monday, June 6th at 12 noon. So um, I will post that information uh, in the chat window. Awesome. So I will, I'll provide a brief introduction to it. Um, Basically, Flat World Knowledge offers free online access to these textbooks, and they're all available under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share-like license. If users want a print version, they can order it from Flat World at a low cost. They can also order supplemental materials. And what Flat World does is they work with traditional publishers from the get-go. They champion quality authors. They make sure texts are peer-reviewed and professionally developed and copy edited. They provide customer service, and their authors also get paid. But the average print textbook at Flat World costs thirty dollars or one ninety nine a chapter versus the one hundred to two hundred dollars that students normally pay for textbooks. And Flat World also offers customization tools for teachers and students to mix and match chapters of textbooks to really make the book their own. And this is an example of the uh, of a textbook, a platform where they can, you know, grab and move things, um, annotate it, delete it, edit it. And this is all done using an open source platform. So like Someone asked earlier about software. They're using an open source software uh, platform, not under Creative Commons licenses, but under one of the software licenses. Another commercial endeavor is Bloomsbury Academic. You may have heard of it. It's a very famous, um, it's a scholarly imprint of the very famous Bloomsbury Publishing, PLC, which is the publisher of the Harry Potter series. And this uh, scholarly imprint publishes research-based books in the humanities and social sciences. And in order to increase the reach and impact of these books, Bloomsbury Academic encourages its authors to release their works under a Creative Commons license that allows for non-commercial reuse. So they don't, I don't think they license all of their works away, but they have um, a line where they work with authors to put this license on it to increase distribution. And the cost of making these titles freely available online is offset by hard copy purchases by libraries and individuals. 
Um, they also publish and sell textbooks under all rights reserved copyright. So they basically have this hybrid business model that increases exposure and capital gain at the same time. So those are two uh, commercial kind of examples of use of Creative Commons. Um, so they would obviously choose a non-commercial license because they want to reserve the commercial rights. Um, but there is um, other projects out there that are nonprofit or commercial that are using more open licenses. And one of them I want to mention because it's a personal favorite of mine um, is the Peer to Peer University or P2PU. So this, if you go to p2pu.org, p2pu.org will take you to the old website. Um, but if you go to new.p2pu.org, you'll see what you see on my screen. Um, and basically. P2PU, I'm involved as a volunteer, and I've been involved in the pilot from the very beginning. It started several years ago. It's an online community of volunteers from around the world who run university level courses online. Anyone can run a course, and anyone can take a course. It's a project that started when a group of open education advocates realized that there was an abundance of OER available that no one was really taking advantage of. So anyone can watch a physics lecture from MIT for free, but how much can you really learn on your own when you're watching kind of a boring physics lecture? And to actually obtain an official MIT education is very expensive. So what these people thought was missing was a social aspect or the social wrapper around open educational resources. They argued that learning really happens at the social layer. And the social layer is what universities and institutions do really well. In fact, one of the Probably, I would say one of the highest values of a university education is that it organizes learning and it puts people in a social environment where peers can learn from each other. And what P2PU does is it moves this social layer to an open online environment. So think of it as online book clubs for short university level courses. So far, P2PU has run six week long courses. And these courses are designed, organized, and facilitated by volunteers all around the world but it's up to the participants in the course or the peers to really learn from each other. And what P2PU does is they build on the existing open educational resources, so like MIT OpenCourseWare or the material on connections that are under various licenses, but it also produces its own content under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike license, which is compatible with all Wikipedia content. And this is an example of a recent uh, P2PU course called Getting Your CC Project Funded. And it's run by one of our CC volunteers in Sweden. And it just ended, I believe. But the course was about um, helping people who had a Creative Commons project get funding for it. And there was about 15 to 20 participants around the world. And there was a lot of participation. I think it went really well. So you can feel free to check that out. And I think Jonas, who is the course organizer, is actually going to run the course again um, at the next PGP cycle or in the next next one. So I would you know, keep an eye out for that news. We'll definitely blog about it. So that's PGPU. I've been involved. I've been a course organizer myself. As Marty mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, I did creative nonfiction writing, which I ran twice. Um, and I have not run that again yet. But anyone is also free to take my course materials that I um, developed and run it on their own because it's all under an open Creative Commons license. You don't have to ask me for, for permission. You can just go ahead and do it. Um, So those are only a few examples of projects and companies using Creative Commons licenses um, in education and culture generally. You can check out many, many more stories of Creative Commons projects and people at our wiki. So that's the link to our wiki. And because it's a wiki, you can add yourself. If you're using CC licenses and you think your story is compelling, you can add a case study about yourself. Or if you find a case study that you think should be on there, you can add it yourself and develop it. Oh, okay. and this is an ongoing project. Yes. Tony asked, "Does P2PU have math classes?" Yes, actually, and they just started a school called the School of Mathematics and Something. So it's kind of an innovative approach to math. I think it's more of a hands-on approach, and I, I think the schools are actually linked on the site. So if you can't find it, email me, and I'll um, link you to it. But they actually ran a bunch of courses. Uh, in the last cycle. But it should be linked on our website. They have several schools. They have a school of math. They have a school of um, webcraft that is, yes, that, you're right, school of mathematical future. They have a school of webcraft, which is a partnership with the Mozilla Foundation. 
um, and that teaches web developer skills and designer schools design skills. And they also have, I think, a school of uh, social innovation. It's called like the School of Soci for short or something. Um, so I would definitely check those out. And Blaine has a question about GNL licenses. So they're GNU licenses or the GNU licenses. Uh, I'm not an expert on those, but they are basically, you know, license. You know, you can't use a CC license for software, but if you go to GNU.org, let me put, put that into the chat. Um, you can put one of their licenses on your software, depending on what you want to use it for. But there's also a whole host of other uh, open software licenses that people use. Yes, uh, the GNU license, there's a documentation license. Um, there's a documentation license that's for documentation, and that was that's also for content that uh, that Wikipedia used to be under, and the reason they developed that documentation license was that there was documentation about software that they wanted to openly license, but Creative Commons didn't exist at that time, so they developed a GNU FDL license. But then Wikipedia realized once Creative Commons came along that, you know, our licenses were much better for content, um, written content and stuff like that, and so they, that's why they converted to the BIASA license by, like, a huge community vote. So recommend CC licenses for content that's not software, and for software, the GNU or other open source software licenses. So, Maestro asked, can you clarify the non-commercial license? For example, if I put the textbook or courseware on my site, and my site has advertising to pay, what if I don't charge for it, et cetera? So this is a pretty frequent question. Um, we can't offer legal advice on this matter, but Basically, the definition of non-commercial is pretty straightforward. It says something like, if you're the purpose of like you're making a profit off of it. Um, if you're in doubt, what I would do is contact the you know the author of the image or whatever you're using, because it really Crib Commons the license is a contract between the licensor and the licensee. So as long as you guys agree uh, what commercial use is. Um, there should be no problem. But, but yeah, in that sense, I can't give you legal advice because I'm not a lawyer, and we do not give legal advice as an organization. Brad has a question, too. Okay. Our it? community college is starting an online journal showcasing our students' works. Their works might be useful as models or for information on their areas of research. Does each student whose work appears in the journal need to make a separate CC license, or can the journal make agreement to CC licensing a condition for publication? Um, so you can just, um, that depends on also your community college copyright policies. But I would say that if all the students, you know, agree, they all sign something, um, and you guys decide that the online journal by default will be under such and such license, that's um, something you can do where the entire journal is under by default this license, and if someone wants to opt out, they can, and then they just have to put a notice that this particular article is not under a CC license. Um, or you could individually license articles, but that would be more of a headache. Can a CC, so a question from Rand, can a CC license be entered into photo metadata at the time a picture is taken? If not, is CC working on that solution? Um, so currently, no. That's um, that would be very high tech. It would be built into like cameras, I guess. Um, we're not actually working on a solution to that problem, but so a solution to problems raised like the shot of a shuttle takeoff from an airliner. So I'm not familiar exactly what the what that problem was. Do you, Rand, do you want to? Can he talk or explain? No talk. Uh, explain in the chat window. Yeah, I, you do have a microphone, but it's um, you'll need to run the audio setup wizard to use it. And Kathy, so I answered Kathy's question in the meanwhile. What would reason be to opt out of a group group license? Um, you know, whatever you want. Who, if you're an individual and you don't want a CC license, something, um, and there's an option and you don't want to be part of that group, you know, it's really up to that individual. Creative Commons is an opt-in system. 
Um, but of course, you know, a university could implement forward journal that's mandated that it be under CC BY. Well, in that case, you couldn't opt out. But um, from our standpoint, Creative Commons is an opt in system. People license if they want to, if they don't want to, they don't. And Rand does have a follow up. He says uh, if a passenger took a shot and shared it via Twitter and it went viral. Oh, so like they should, if that passenger wanted to immediately put it under CC. Um, yeah, so you can't immediately put it under CC, but what that passenger could have done is uploaded it to Flickr right away and let CC license it. Um, then it could have been tried that way. Maybe there's a way that we could work with like Wi-Fog or one of the TwitPic, you know, tools in the future to implement CC licensing. That's something we haven't yet explored, I think, because of the different terms that all those tools have right now, but that's a, that's a good suggestion. And Micah sees a business opportunity in Rand's question. He might be able to develop a smartphone app. Yes, so any of you guys can do that. <laughs> all of our you know, technology is open on our wiki. Um, the development tools are it's all there. So let me type in. Oh, Mike is not going to do it himself. <laughs> uh, Kathy uh, says she imagines there's a student who um, sees a benefit to opting out. Most colleges that I'm aware of, and Jane, maybe you can know more than I do, um, have legal language in their college uh, contracts with their students that the student's work actually belongs to the college. So if the college decides to uh, license it under Creative Commons, then I don't see where the student has any recourse. Um, so you're correct that some, some colleges do have that policy, but we actually um, worked on this project for a while that we dropped. We did research on many university policies, and basically each university is really different. Some colleges um, you know, claim copyright ownership over students' intellectual work, and some don't. Um, some only claim, you know, property over staff creations, and some, you know, even with faculty work, it's it's a toss up depending on which college. So the policies are all different. Um, as for Kathy's question, if a student asks if there's a benefit to opt out, um, I I mean I can't really think that there's a benefit to opt out for a student because if it's their work, I mean after they submit it, it's just really no one's going to see it ever again after they graduate. Um, and if it's important that they want to spread that work, then putting a CC license on it actually ensures that it will remain open um, for you know the rest of their life type of thing, and they can always have access to it. Whereas a lot of people will write dissertations and it gets copyrighted maybe by the university, it gets put into a file and it's archived. And then I've heard stories of people who can't even access their own dissertations from like 20 years ago because you know it belongs to the university now. So. I imagine it goes the other way. There's a lot of benefits to actually opting in. Oh, Kathy's got an um, explanation. Say, if I'm a student, I wrote an awesome short story, and I want to submit it to a publisher. I need to opt out of a class license, so it's my own CC license? So the class, uh, it depends on what the policy of the class is. I think it would be fine if the class just kind of made a default under Creative Commons attribution, but so that the student retains their copyright. So if it was, you know, everything's going to be default in this journal or in this class under a CC license, but you, it will be default to you. So it will be the student retains the copyright. It's just under that license. Um, that would be one way of going about it. Um, but it really depends on. These are all theoreticals. It depends on the, you know, the policy of that class or that journal, etc. And since we just have about five minutes, I'm going to warn everybody. I'm going to uh, open up a web browser on your machine with the evaluation survey for this presentation. And uh, feel free, uh, Jane can still answer questions, but do feel free to fill it out and be sure you choose that the evaluation is for the Creative Commons session and send it in. We need to know what you think and how we can improve. So Jane, go right ahead. Any more questions? Yeah, are there any more questions? No. 
you know, it sounds like people may be busy working on the evaluation survey. In the meantime, I'm... Question. Okay. What do you mean, can you do a CC license? Um, it depends, again, on your university policy, so you should probably check with your um, your your university policy, like your lawyers or that the copyright department, um, what the policy is on student-produced work. If the policy is a student has re retains the copyright, um, then you would have to, you know, get your students to agree to, uh, if they all agree to publish under CC license and publish a journal, then there's no problem. But um, if the university on that retains copyright of that work, then you would have to clear it with the university. And uh, Stacy is asking, I've got had this question a few times throughout. Is this session uh, recorded for f further review? It is most definitely being recorded and will be available through the OTC portal. And it's um, we haven't opened the portal yet, but uh, if you haven't already signed up to register for the online teaching conference, please do. If you can't afford to come face to face, which we really hope you do because we rarely get to see everybody, but uh, do sign up to be an online attendee. The price is right and you will have uh, access to all the recordings and the live sessions that are being, uh, uh, that are being webcast. Oh, here's uh, Blaine's on the YouTube archive. Oh, um, well, Marty, if this video is under what what license will this video be under? This uh, recording. Of course, yeah, it'll <laughs> be licensed under Creative Commons, share and share alike, non-commercial. Okay. Well then, if it's under a non-commercial share alike license, then you can't put it. Um, you can't actually put the license on YouTube for that particular license, but you can release it on YouTube and then put it in the notes that it's under that license. Um, but so, going back to the YouTube announcement, we just announced today that YouTube has. Um, let me copy and post the link to the blog post I just wrote today, actually. Um, but basically, YouTube launched support for the Creative Commons Attribution License. So what that means is that you can now, if you have a YouTube account or you upload videos to YouTube, you can license them under the Attribution License. So they only chose one license, the most open license. Um, and it means you can just click a button and license it that way. And they have also provided a library of Creative Commons Attribution License materials that are pulling from Various organizations for you to, you know, remix and use, and that's kind of huge because you, we've been talking to YouTube for years, and today they finally did it. So we're hoping it works out. But yeah, so if you want to put YouTube videos under any other licenses. There's no capabilities right now. You could just have to put it in the notes. Yeah, I've got I, I want to say to Jane and the, the rest of the audience, I first found out about Creative Commons oh, must have been at least six years ago. maybe five. But um, I'm amazed at and also encouraged by how many people have picked up on it and are using it and have gone way beyond I'd ever thought it could be used. It's really a very valuable resource for educators. Yeah, great. Thank you, all of you guys, for being here. Um, and if you have, I hope I was not too boring. I, I have noticed comments by a couple of you, um, but you know, please put that in the feedback. I do want to improve um, webinars. It's kind of tough when it's a webinar because you're kind of just talking at people for a while. But um, but yeah, feel free to email me if you have any other questions. 
And do you remember you can save the chat window? Uh, it uh, looks like a blue floppy disk icon. It's at the top of your window, your Illuminate window at the top left. Just click on that and save the chat as text to your own computer. The reason why that's a good thing to do is you'll get all the URLs that were put up in the chat window. And thank you everybody. I'm going to stop the recording, but if Jane can stick around a little bit, we'll still be glad to answer your questions. <laughs>